And when I got into um, the flight testing activity at Wright Field, I found that very, very interesting and uh, exciting. A lot of people uh, probably think that test flying is, and a test pilot is kind of a glamorous job. The old cliche about uh, hours and hours of boredom and moments of terror are uh, uh, truly um, apply to test flying. Uh, wind coupling experiments. Uh, the genesis of that program was a concept developed by one of the uh, German engineers, the German scientists that came back to the United States after World War II. And he had this idea that if you took a basic airplane, you got a basic airplane, and if somehow or other you could put a floating panel, uh, just an extension of the wing, that if you could do that, you could extend the range of that airplane very cheaply. During the first test on the 19th of August, 1949, Major C.E. Anderson, Flight Test Division pilot of the Q-14, experienced difficulty in controlling his airplane after the coupling was made. A strong rolling motion to the right occurred, and before control could be obtained, the coupling inadvertently released. On July 21, 1950, the first B-29 bomber to be equipped with the new floating wingtip mechanisms took off the runway for a coupling test with an F-84 fighter. On this date, Major C.E. Anderson of Air Materiel Command's Flight Test Division made the first successful coupling to the wingtip of the B-29. On July 30, 1950, Captain J.M. Davis, also of the Flight Test Division, successfully coupled to the left wing of the B-29. During this flight, Captain Davis experienced a partial loss of aileron boost, but still was able to effect two couplings with some difficulty. On August 22, 1950, both fighters were simultaneously coupled to the B-29 for the first time. He comes in, hooks up, turns the autopilot on, and the thing violently pitched up, which of course rotated him over on his back, and, and uh, it, it actually tore the whole outer panel of B-29 from the engine out to the tip, broke that off, he hit the spar, sliced the nose off the F-84. I have a funny philosophy about life. I think things are going to happen to you, that they're going to happen. Have I ever worried about, about flying? No. I've never worried about it. <laughs> I just never have had that feeling. I've always felt that things would be right, and so far they have. From the earliest conception of strategic bombing, there has existed a requirement never previously fulfilled for fighter protection of bombers when over the target area. Now it appears bombers may tow two jet fighters to the target and back virtually without reducing their radius of action. This recent development of the Air Materiel Command paves the way for fighter escort protection and the solution to this heretofore unsolved problem. Here, the coupling mechanisms were installed using one B-29 and two F-84 fighters for the initial tests. Lances, one mounted on the right wing tip of the F-84 and one on the left wing tip of another, were designed to fit into retractable sockets mounted on each wing tip of a B-29 bomber. The lance enters the socket on the wing tip of the B-29 and automatically locks in place. While the lance head is locked relative to the B-29 socket, the F-84 can roll about the lance shaft. 
A mechanical connection between the lance shaft and the F-84 ailerons functions automatically to restore the fighter to normal flight position if any displacement in roll occurs. A sponge rubber bumper was provided to make a tight seal between the wing tips of the two airplanes. The normal position for engagement is with the socket extended 19 inches. Thus projected out of the major portion of the B-29's wingtip vortex, it enables the fighter pilot to affect a coupling more easily. These modifications increase the gross weight of the B-29 by 700 pounds. However, only local reinforcement of the wings was determined necessary. The accompanying animated diagrams illustrate the principle of the floating wingtip mechanism and how it operates in flight. After the bomber has extended its socket, the fighter approaches the bomber and inserts its lance into the socket. The socket depresses a small button on the leading edge of the fighter wing. The button actuates a switch which causes the tip of the lance to rotate 90 degrees inside the socket. This locks the fighter to the bomber in tow. Since the lance is oval in cross-section, it cannot rotate within the socket. The socket is then retracted, drawing the fighter wing tightly against the bomber wing. The rubber bumper along the bomber wing tip seals the air gap between the two wings. On July 21, 1950, the first B-29 bomber to be equipped with the new floating wing tip mechanisms took off the runway for a coupling test with an F-84 fighter. On this date, Major C.E. Anderson of Air Materiel Command's Flight Test Division made the first successful coupling to the wingtip of the B-29. Four successful couplings were made this day. The average time to couple varied from two to ten minutes, and the total couple time was thirty minutes. On July 30th, 1950, Captain J.M. Davis, also of the Flight Test Division, successfully coupled to the left wing of the B-29. During this flight, Captain Davis experienced a partial loss of aileron boost, but still was able to effect two couplings with some difficulty. Several more couplings were successfully accomplished by both the left and right fighters individually in order to gain more pilot experience. On August 22, 1950, both fighters were simultaneously coupled to the B-29 for the first time. Data from these tests indicate that two F-84 aircraft could be towed by a B-29 carrying 10,000 pounds bomb load with a reduction in range of only 2.9%. Several changes are now being made which will result in an operational combination. The original installation was designed to obtain data over relatively short flights. Therefore, no provisions were made to change the relative angle of pitch between the three airplanes. It was discovered during the flight test program that the mechanical system of controlling the position of the fighters in roll is marginal. Here they will uncouple from the bomber. They will be free to escort the bomber into the target area and out again. They may do individual reconnaissance missions. Once out of the target area, they will recouple to the bomber for the tow home. It should be borne in mind that this installation was designed for test purposes to provide engineering data and not considered at this time to be a prototype installation. The Germans had, during the war, had done a considerable amount of work on wingtip towing. What they were doing was, their theory was that you could add anything out on a wingtip of an airplane, and the increased in aspect ratio of the wing gave you sufficient lift to more than counterbalance the increased drag. So in effect, you got free, free fuel tanks, at, at, which is one of the things they used it for. Somewhere along the line, it was one of the Germans that came over, uh, Ben Homan was his name. Uh, it was one of the paperclip 
crowd that came over after the war. And he was convinced that what you really ought to do was tow a couple of fighters on the wingtip uh, of a looking out of the B-36. Since we couldn't come up with a fighter with sufficient range as an escort fighter, the idea was that the bomber would carry his own escort, and when he came under attack, he'd, they'd release and go fly. And the idea was to carry three of them, one on each wingtip and one in the fuselage. The one in the fuselage, the pilot could get out and relax and do whatever he needed to do and eat, and then they'd take turns rotating around. It was pretty, pretty far out idea, but that was the idea. And they went on to a program, I believe it was called Tom Tom, in which they put two F-84s on the wingtip of the B-29. The effort to keep the airplane out there flying was, uh, the workload was tremendous. So what they had to do was get an autopilot that would keep the airplane stable. Uh, Buddy Anderson and Johnny Davis were flying the 284s on a B-29. They were flying out of the Republic plant on Long Island. And it was to be the first test of the autopilot. Bud Anderson hooked up, could not get his autopilot to engage, so he disengaged from the from the B-29. John Davis hooked up on the other wing, engaged his autopilot. Immediately, it was a hard over, nose up, which pitched the airplane, rolled the test, up elevator, hooked up like that, caused the airplane to roll. Rolled over, came down on the wingtip of the B-29, knocked half the wingtip of the B-29 off. That airplane went in with its full crew. John Davis flew around for a while, but uh, couldn't get out, and he was killed on landing. During the course of World War II, German aircraft designers embraced many unusual concepts. Some worked, but not all. The Blumen Voss P163, a product of the mind of Richard Vogt, a German aircraft designer who conceived of many weird and wonderful designs during World War II. At a time when the shortage of aluminum was starting to affect aircraft production, the P-163 concept offered a way of partially utilizing steel as an alternative, at least in a limited way. Of course, there would be a weight penalty. However, the additional strength of steel might allow the wings to support a crew gondola on each wingtip, thereby allowing much more free space in the main fuselage for engines, weapons and fuel. Each of the gondolas would have weighed about one ton. Vogt predicted that they would actually improve flight performance by reducing both bending in the wings and turbulence from their outer edges. Project 163 was envisioned as a high-speed bomber, fulfilling some of the multiple roles performed by the famous Junkers Ju-88. The Junkers plane was clearly in the fast bomber class. It had a crew of three or four, grouped together to improve morale and enable better communication. However, the aircraft was lightly armed and relied mainly on speed for survival against enemy fighters. In contrast, the design of Blumenvoss's new proposal necessitated having two separate crew seating positions separated by at least 60 feet. The 163 was manned by a crew of four, with two men in each gondola. There would be a single pilot who would have a spectacular view, not disrupted by turning propellers. More significantly, the pilot sat back to back with his navigator and part-time gunner, who was in an excellent position to cover the rear and left flank of the aircraft. To balance the architecture, Project 163's other gondola had two gunners, one facing aft, the other forward, 
At least in theory, this high-speed bomber would have been very well protected. Not surprisingly, there were serious concerns about the actual control of such a revolutionary layout. How would a pilot react to being at the very tip of an aircraft rather than the center? To test the impact of this position on the pilot, an early asymmetric folk design was modified. An additional gondola was added to the BV-141's port wing and tested. Another major advantage of the wingtip cockpit was that it would leave the 163's main fuselage less cluttered, leaving space for a power plant that consisted of two engines coupled together, driving counter-rotating propellers in a centerline thrust. At about the same time that Project 163 was being developed, the centerline thrust approach was also being explored in the south of Germany by the Dornier Company. Their DO-335 Arrow heavy fighter bomber design was also based on the principle of centerline thrust. One engine set in the traditional nose position and another placed in the center of the fuselage, driving a propeller at the very back of the aircraft. In the United States, another company, Douglas Aircraft, were also engrossed in another centerline thrust project which was just as revolutionary. The XB-42, or Mixmaster, was designed as a fast, long-range bomber. It employed two engines mounted near the middle of the airframe, driving separate propellers grouped together at the rear. The XB-42's layout, like that of the DO-335, resulted in extremely clean flying surfaces that made for increased speed and maneuverability. Both aircraft were finally made, and with testing so advanced, they probably would have gone into production if the war had continued. Meanwhile, back in Germany, the war was not going well, and the benefits of all new aircraft projects were being seriously reappraised. Although it was reasonable to assume that Blumenvoss had a design that would be the equal of the Junkers Ju-88 in speed and range, and it would also have offered considerably more defensive gunnery, there was still caution about the practicality of the crew positions. How would pilots feel about such an unusual design? The acid test would be the adapted 141 asymmetric plane. The standard BV-141 actually worked quite well. The addition of yet another gondola at the very tip of one wing made the aircraft even more bizarre looking, but it served its purpose and apparently proved that the wingtip cockpit arrangement was workable. However, workable just wasn't enough. Project 163 was cancelled before a prototype was built there would be no armadas of this unusual-looking aircraft flying over enemy targets, and the addition of another gondola at the very tip of one wing did not turn it into a swan. But it served its purpose and apparently proved the wingtip cockpit arrangement was acceptable. Another factor behind the decision to cancel the 163 was its performance. It simply did not offer any major improvement on what was already proven and available. But performance was not Richard Vogt's primary objective in designing the 163. His goal was to find a way of substituting steel for aluminum, which at the time was in short supply. But as the war progressed, not only aluminum, but all materials in Germany were in short supply. But Richard Vogt's revolutionary concept would later be vindicated by the United States Air Force. In 1949, the Northrop F-89 Scorpion was finally selected by Air Defense Command as its mainstay all-weather interceptor. It was to be armed with cannons, but the A, B and C models displayed structural problems in the wings and there were some losses. In 1954, the D model entered service. This had a much strengthened wing, 
and a huge pod mounted on both wing tips. Each pod contained 52 Mighty Mouse rockets. The F-89D became the main production version of the Scorpion and perhaps supported Volk's theory on wing bending and turbulence. The post-war B-17 clearly demonstrated the benefits of Volk's wingtip theory. We had a B-17 there that had a crew position on a right wingtip. Uh, the reason they did that was to develop uh, a central gun control. So they had this on the B-29. Uh, however, it wasn't on a wingtip. But uh, that was what the airplane was built for. However, the war was over and everybody forgot about that, uh, except the Aeromed people thought, oh, what a wonderful thing to find out what it is like to roll an airplane if you're not on the roll axis. Everybody said it didn't really make any difference, but uh, they insisted on doing it, and they built a cockpit in that position out there using the formation stick, which was uh, worked through the autopilot, and you could fly the airplane from this position out on the wingtip. So I, I, got to, I got to fly it. The one thing you did learn was, you know, when you're in turbulent air, you keep seeing the wings flap up and down. That's not exactly what's happening. The wings are more, tips are more or less steady. It's the fuselage that's moving up and down. And you could sit out there on that wing tip and jiggle the formation stick longitudinally and make the people in the airplane sick and you were hardly moving. But you didn't do it too much because they'd get mad at you and uh, get even with you later. <laughs> In recognition of his genius, Richard Vogt was invited immediately after the war to work in America. He contributed to many designs, including the ambitious Tiptoe Project and its many variants. From 1933 until the end of the Second World War, German aviation led the world in aerodynamic design and technical innovation. Long before the outbreak of hostilities, German industry produced an armada of technically superior warplanes. When war broke out, the Luftwaffe quickly overwhelmed some of Europe's most vaunted air forces. Classic designs like the BF-109 fighter and Ju-88 proved to be superior fighting machines, while others like the Blumenvoss BV-141 became one of aviation's true oddities. Germany's plan for war in Europe called for an air force that was to be used in direct support of its ground forces. The Luftwaffe's task was to sweep the skies clear of enemy fighters, then destroy enemy troops and installations. Key to the Luftwaffe's success were ground attack aircraft like the Henschel 123 and Ju-87 dive bomber. Ordered in 1934, the Henschel 123 proved to be a rugged and reliable aircraft. It would see service well into 1944. Ground attack was only effective when good battlefield observation and reconnaissance could locate enemy targets. That job was given to the Henschel 126. With its excellent low-speed short field characteristics, an outstanding all-round view. The HS-126 proved a great success in the early campaigns of 1939 and 1940. The HS-126 would see action on every front, but by 1941 its limited performance was beginning to show and a new battlefield reconnaissance aircraft was needed. This led to some of the war's most unusual designs. The Blumenvoss company was one of the first to respond with their BV-141. Designed around the concept of maximum all-round view, the BV-141 was in many ways a problem looking for a solution. The unorthodox design featured an asymmetric layout with the radial engine installed at the front end of a port-side tail boom. 
in an extensively glazed crew nacelle mounted to starboard. Unusual and radical in design, the BV-141 performed surprisingly well, but in the end, it was considered too unconventional and it was cancelled in 1943. Yes, in my meandering throughout Germany, um, just after the capitulation, um, I was looking for unusual or advanced technology aircraft. And the 141 intrigued me a little, but I had heard that there were at an airfield called Gröschenhain, which was quite near Meissen, um, there was a big reconnaissance unit, which had many reconnaissance types of aircraft. And I thought maybe the 141 will appear there. So I flew there and um, there was no sign of one, but I asked if I could speak to some of the POWs who were uh, in the cage there. And um, one of the chaps told me that um, a 141 had indeed been there, but the last he remembered of it was not too long ago. It had had an engine problem while flying nearby and had landed on an emergency strip east of uh, Grossenheide. So I flew over in that direction looking for this strip, but it wasn't really a strip I found. It was a small airfield, and uh, it was... By well, this time, I'd moved into the Russian occupation zone, and um, I decided to land there because I had already found that at that stage, after the war, the Russians were still very amenable to the Brits because we had come into the early stages of the war to help them. Anyway, when I landed, um, there weren't a lot of aircraft there, and um, there was a Russian commissar and with an interpreter. And I asked if there was a 141 there. He didn't really know things like the aircraft numbers. And, but he said there were one or two aircraft left. But his people had been, had examined their field, taken away what they wanted, and the rest was left for destruction. So I said, could I have a look around and see what it was? He said, well, yes, why not? Because it's all going to be destroyed anyway. And um, in one hangar, there was indeed a 141. It had regularly had its engines run up by Feltwebel, who um, was available. And I said to him, was the aircraft flyable? And he, he declared, oh, yes, it was. Um, I rather suspected his motive, so I wasn't too sure of what he was saying or, or believing what he was saying, because I think he had hoped I would fly him out of there and out of the Russian zone. <clears throat> but uh, the Russians were obviously not going to play with that. Anyway, I thought I'll take his word for it and have a go at this. And um, the commissar didn't object. He said, as long as I stayed within sight of the airfield, and I'd only have enough fuel to do that, um, he didn't mind because um, it was <laughs> due for destruction anyway. <laughs> and uh, so he let me fly that, and I had about 30 to 40 minutes in it to try out this theory that it flew very nicely um, in a straight line when uh, at, uh, on an angle of bank of 90 degrees. And uh, after about two or three goes at this at various speeds and heights, I had trouble with the engine, so I had to return to base. And um, so I formed an impression that it probably did what it said it could do, but its real reason for failing, in my opinion, was it certainly wasn't an aircraft in the same category of handling as the Focke-Wolf 189, which I had already flown, and was its competitor. Another odd-looking aircraft was the Focke-Wolf 189, a completely glazed central nacelle, 
twin engines and tail booms were considered too radical for conservative Luftwaffe officials. Performance, however, won the day. Known as the Flying Eye, the FW-189 proved supremely versatile, universally popular, and one of the most reliable aircraft ever to see Luftwaffe service. During combat operations, the FW-189 surpassed all expectations. Despite flying low over the battlefield and taking large amounts of damage, it had the ability to absorb punishment and fight another day. So I think that killed it more than the theory that um, it gave them the, the gunner a wonderful field of fire by having no um, starboard half of the tailplane and um, being asymmetrically offset to give a, few, a clear field of fire to the gunner. So that was my experience of it. Not very impressive, um, but um, interesting. The Arado 234 was a beautiful looking airplane. Aesthetically, it was very clean and looked dynamic, aerodynamically, very attractive. And um, the cockpit was unusual. It was a glass cockpit right at the nose. And it uh, reminded me, when I got into it, rather of like being in a helicopter. You were stuck right out in the front there with completely clear vision around you. On the other hand, you were sitting pretty close to the accident if it had to happen too. And um, my first meeting with the 234 wasn't a very happy event because this was up at Grover in Denmark where we found a number of 234s. And I had one prepared for a flight by the German crew, because we obviously didn't have the expertise to deal with it at that stage. And um, I taxied it out to the end of the runway. I was well aware, of course, that the Jumo 004 engines, which were fitted to it, had a scrap life, total scrap life of 25 hours. So one really needed to know the service history of the engines who were flying. Now, the Germans were very, very adept at destroying documentation, and we could find no service records. However, I taxied out to the end of the runway at Grover and um, revved up to full power, ready for takeoff, and then just about to release the brakes when the starboard engine exploded and totally disintegrated, taking most of the starboard wing with it. And um, this, of course, could have mean one of two things. Either the crew had sabotaged it, or uh, it was an engine with 24 hours and 50 minutes on it. We never got to the bottom of what caused it, but uh, let, suffice it to say that I must have flown something like three to four hundred hours on the Jumo 004 and various aircraft and um, never had another problem with it after that. So it did not um, give me a poor impression of the 234. On the contrary, when I flew it, it was a very nice aircraft to handle at a very fast turn of speed. Uh, it was, it could fly at turn Cruise at well, its top speed was 474 miles an hour, which was very high. And of course, it relied on this speed for its survival because it had no guns fitted to it and um, was purely a reconnaissance bomber as such. But as I say, it handled beautifully. It was straight wing, was not swept wing, and um, made a very good impression. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.